Good afternoon. Welcome to Mary Greeley Medical Center Grand Rounds featuring Dr. Rakshak Sarda from the Iowa Heart Center. Dr. Sarda did his medical training in Rajasthan, India, and then we are so lucky he came to the United States, went to internal medicine uh, residency at Wayne State, then on to UT, University of Texas in Galveston for his cardiology training. Uh, Dr. Sarda is what I would consider a lifelong learner um, and somebody who loves to take board exams because he is board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular medicine, echocardiography, nuclear medicine, advanced heart failure, and probably one of the only physicians in the state of Iowa board certified in the newest subspecialty of hypertension and hypertensive disease. So he just um, is always looking for another board to study for and take. We've been so lucky to have him with the Iowa Heart Center Ames office and Des Moines offices for the last 12 years, which have passed very quickly. Most of you know Dr. Sarda. He's eternally available for consults, add-on consults, seeing patients, reviewing extra EKGs or phone calls any time of the day including weekends for most of our referring positions. So I am so pleased today, he's gonna to give you his excellent approach to the patient with chest pain and also speak on a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which, are, which is the wearable tech devices, which we're heavily promoting during these days where our patients are a little further than an arm's length from us. So we could continue to evaluate their vitals, their heart rhythm, O2 sats and many other things. So thank you, Dr. Sarda, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Dr. Sorrentino, for kind and nice introduction. This uh, presentation is done in an empty auditorium. Uh, I'll be talking to you guys uh, via Zoom. Dr. Hallberg the other day asked me to do a presentation on chest pain, what test to order? And I was strictly told that we have to review this topic in 35 to 40 minutes. And then we'll talk about some variable devices, uh, which Dr. Holberg was interested in knowing uh, what is current situation. Um, no uh, relevant financial disclosures here. Uh, I modified uh, some slides uh, from some lectures uh, available on the web, so uh, they may be copied. Um, and then the journals and the pictures are from the, some web images. So first of all, what are the causes of chest pain? A patient walks in the ER in an office and complains of chest pain. It can be so many different things and to order uh, a test, we need to figure it out, what is relevant, what is important, where it is coming from, and that is from history and physical. Uh, so right from the pericardium, we can have pericarditis. Uh, if you look into the myocardium, you can have myocarditis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and heart failure exacerbation uh, can sometimes represent that. Takotsubo, cardiomyopathy is stress cardiomyopathy. We are seeing a lot of patients about it, uh, which has to be kept in mind. Uh, if you look into the endocardium, you can talk about valves and aortic stenosis. The cardinal feature is angina. And then tachyarrhythmias, usually uh, chest pain is because of demand ischemia, and sometimes bradyarrhythmias because of decreased cardiac output. Uh, acute coronary syndrome, aortic dissection, uh, these are the uh, other important things we have to know. And hypertension in an emergent situation can present with chest pain. When you go to the pulmonary causes, it may be pleuritis, pneumothorax, uh, asthma attacks can present as chest pain, pneumonia, we see it all the time. Pulmonary embolism is one other thing which we have to consider because there may be mimicking from ACS and the treatment becomes a little different. Pulmonary hypertension patients and lung cancer to be kept in mind. Depending upon these things, we will decide what our algorithm of testing should be. GI causes should not be disc discounted. GERD, esophagitis, esophageal spasm, gastritis, peptic ulcer disease are common presentations for chest pain and the other way around also uh, that it can be a presentation of 
ACS, which comes like this, and we should not be missing the other side also. Then we have the rib cage, uh, ribs fracture, costochondritis. Systemic diseases like anemia can cause chest pain, and usually it's a demand ischemia. Uh, we all come across uh, for a chest pain consult where the diagnosis ends up being herpes zoster, so that's where your physical exam is important. Uh, we are seeing a lot of cases, even in central Iowa, of, of cocaine and um, amphetamines, mainly meth, who presented with chest pain. We have less of sickle cell anemia, acute chest syndrome patients, but uh, uh, in my training, I saw a lot of these patients in uh, Wayne State in Detroit when I was uh, doing my training. And uh, psychiatric cases of panic attack or somatization, we see it all the time. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, patients in arrhythmias may have PVCs and they think of uh, having uh, chest pain. Um, and that is uh, very, very common uh, when they have one uh, PVCs and they feel there is something going on and they show up in the ER. So how to deal with these things? So first of all, you need to find out, uh, uh, is it exertional, is it positional? Uh, is it reproducible? Reproducible can be two things. Uh, we walk them, they have chest pain or focal tenderness. So uh, we have to consider uh, examining them with, for focal tenderness, but also sometimes we will walk them in the office and see if, they, we, if we can have chest pain again. And to make sure it's pleuritic. We see a lot of consoles where there is a pleuritic chest pain. Uh, just ask them to take a few deep breaths or cough and uh, you will know uh, uh, which direction you have to go to. Whenever we have patients with chest pain, we first need to make sure that they do not have a life-threatening problem. Uh, and that can be acute coronary syndrome. Uh, we have to act very fast with our treatment algorithms. Pulmonary embolism, again, this uh, uh, can be missed, and there are a lot of deaths which ha happen because of that. Aortic dissection, very, very hard to diagnose. And pneumothorax, which needs to be taken care of right away. And if you look into it, uh, History, physical, uh, an EKG, a chest X-ray, and biomarkers. We'll get to most of these uh, tests at time uh, when you are dealing with these patients in uh, an emergency room situation or uh, in, in hospital settings. In clinic, it's a little different beca uh, because of the availability of the test uh, for this situation. And these patients should not be in the clinic. They should be in the ER. So to get to these uh, patients with these diseases, pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, and pneumothorax, uh, a triple rule out, triple rule out uh, CT scan is still available. A lot of the emergency rooms are still doing it. Uh, we have a slightly higher yield uh, of pulmonary embolism and aortic dissection in emergency departments with this triple root loud CD. And uh, we will go through these things, and it may emerge back again, but it is not in favor much right now uh, as a triple rule out protocol, but we get this information. Uh, the problem is there is a higher non-diagnostic image quality with this. There's a lot of radiation, and then we have to give contrast. So uh, um, uh, Jack Imaging had this uh, editorial in 2015 where they, uh, where they said that it uh, uh, may have value in selected patient, but uh, its uh, indiscriminate use is not warranted. Uh, and appropriate use of uh, triple rule out needs to be further defined. And there are other studies going on right now, uh, and it may come back uh, uh, in our armamentarium. It's, it's still available, and we are doing it here also. To under, I think. So if there is an acute coronary syndrome, you go over the history, the description, uh, you look at the risk factors, uh, then you do the exam where maybe uh, high JVP crackles if heart failure is present, chest X-ray would be normal, and ECG would have dynamic STT wave changes. Uh, this is your initial uh, 10 minutes of exam. 
Uh, and then you do serial troponins. If the troponin is positive, ST segment elevation or dynamic ST segment changes, continuous chest pain, patient is unstable. Uh, this is our typical acute coronary syndrome patient. And in US, uh, uh, we have early invasive therapies, means we take them to the cat lab. Um, and this is pretty much settled deal. Um, and this is what we practice here. To understand people who do not have any of the life-threatening illnesses, and now they are admitted to the hospital, and we have put them on rule-out protocol, their ECGs are stable, the patients are stable, they are not having chest pain, and they have been ruled out by serial troponins. So what do you do with these patients, and how do you have the testing algorithms uh, is the main part of discussion today. To understand that, first we need to understand what is the ischemia cascade. So as there is a decrease in coronary flow, uh, what happens first is the perfusion abnormality. So if there is an initial decrease in the flow, uh, you put the patient on a, under a scanner uh, for a, a SPECT or a PET, uh, you will see the perfusion abnormalities happen. And then there is diastolic dysfunction happens and then systolic dysfunction happens, then we see the ECG changes, and then there are those typical uh, anginal or chest pain signs. So chest pain is way up, way further in this ischemia cascade. So we, if we catch patients somewhere here, um, uh, that will be good, but usually as we increase the exercise load, these things will happen, and then the angina will come. And these things we will also use when we are uh, testing our patients. I'm sorry. So we should, the goal to, uh, should be to choose the optimal type of stress test. And then today we'll talk about uh, what are the diagnostic uh, accuracy of different stress tests and then um, mainly the contraindications when not to do these tests. To understand that, first we need to understand the Bayes theorem. And this says that the probability of a new event or a true positive stress test depends upon the pre-test risk of the patient. Uh, and these are uh, derived from empiric data. And you, you have different uh, tests here and uh, the general uh, depiction of, uh, of uh, mathematical depiction of uh, Bayes' theorem. So if you see, if your pre-test probability is low, 10% or 20%, your post-test probability is also low. And if your pre-test probability is high, your post-test probability is high, and you do not gain too much either on this side or this side. Because if you have low probability, you have a high false positive rate. So even if the patient's pre-test probability is low and you have a positive test, chances are that this is falsely positive test. And we see this all the time. And that is where we have to make sure that uh, we do not test too many people uh, in this limb uh, because we'll get a fast positive. And if the patient is on a high pre-test probability, and even if the test is not negative, uh, you are not going to trust that because there is a high false negative rate. So whenever there is a high probability in any test, pre-test high probability, the post-test, there will be high false negative rates. So we have to keep this in consideration. Uh, but many of our patients are in this category where we are testing and we'll go uh, over that. These are different tests uh, with different pre-test and post-test probabilities here. Biggest question is, should we stress a uh, patient or not to stress? Because there is always a problem uh, 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 of significant cost, and there is a harm associated uh, with unnecessary testing. We do too much testing. There is somewhat unnecessary testing. It causes a lot of false positive which leads to additional procedures which can cause, um, and if they are invasive procedures or if they uh, lead with radiation, et cetera, then there is a harm there. And whenever we are doing a test, we should even, before ordering the test, we should know how we are going to use this information uh, in a meaningful way for a direct management of patient. Um, a positive stress test need to be understood what, how we are going to use it. Now, in this situation, you need to know that if you go, go back to the Bayes theorem, 
these are the people who are in intermediate risk will get the best bang for the buck. Uh, so these are the people we should be testing the most where it is important to find out what's going on. So now, chest pain characteristic is very important in knowing if this patient is uh, high, uh, pre-test probability is high or low. So if it's a substernal chest pain, it's bored by exertion, relieved by rest or nitroglycerin, this is typical angina. And if you have three, three over three, it's typical angina. If uh, two over three, atypical. And if there is only one thing, most likely this is a non-anginal chest pain. And this is very important because when we do the management things, we will know uh, that uh, our main uh, it, reason to do these tests is to have better outcomes in long run. So if you look into these pre-test probabilities, if you have a non-anginal chest pain, uh, and if your age is, say, 40 to 49 in men, your chances of having a disease is 13% in women, um, uh, it's 3% uh, chances. But if, you, if it is a typical angina, you can see that the same age group, the pretest probability increases tremendously. These uh, tables are multiple tables, and I've been seeing them for the last 20 years. They do not change. They, somehow these tables may have a little variance, but these are the people you do not want to test, and, uh, uh, and these are the people you want to test in the middle, and these one would be high probability of uh, having uh, a disease anyway, so I do not know if there is a false, if there is a negative test that will make difference in our uh, further treatment algorithm or not. So the middle ones are the important people we have to uh, check. Now there are multiple tests available, but the basic basics of these tests are either anatomy or physiology. And we are talking about coronary anatomy or coronary physiology. For anatomy, we have CT coronary angiography. And uh, at our institution here, uh, this is available now. Uh, there would be a lot of uh, uh, talk about coronary calcium scoring, and there are a lot of algorithms being made, uh, taking into consideration coronary calcium score, uh, but this is not yet prime time, but we can always use coronary calcium score in our uh, planning of what we are going to do uh, in further testing. Coronary calcium score is cardio score. Um, you can get it done very cheap. It's a CT scan. Uh, and here in our institution, uh, I think uh, uh, if you have one risk factor, they will do it, uh, and they charge $100. Physiological tests are, we are looking at the functional or hemodynamics of it. And uh, uh, either we are looking uh, the hemodynamic direct uh, result of a hemodynamic change or an ECG change. And stress ECG, uh, you call it a, a treadmill-only test, um, uh, exercise stress has multiple different names. Uh, uh, then there is a stress MPI, uh, myocardial perfusion imaging uh, studies, uh, which can be specced. Uh, uh, this is single uh, photon emission uh, tomography, and this is uh, uh, PET is positron emission tomography. And then there is uh, stress MRI, which is new kid in the block. Not many people do it, and stress of echocardiography, which is our workhorse. And then uh, what do we get from uh, this uh, functional uh, test? So these are very important. Uh, it has been going on for 30 to 40 years. We have a lot of literature about it. Uh, they are helpful in localizing and quantifying ischemia. So this is important to quantify ischemia. Uh, they can assess wall motion, both at rest and post-stress. Uh, we can evaluate pericardium and aorta in echo or MRI. And we can do valve assessment also with aortic stenosis, uh, which can uh, cause chest pains. So these are very, very important, and we uh, test uh, because of these features which we get. Now, when to do imaging. So before that, we should say when not to do imaging. So if you can do an exercise treadmill test, please do it. Uh, and for that, all you need is a normal ECG. 
You can do it in right bundle branch block if the ST segments are okay. So right bundle branch block itself is not a contraindication and patient has to be able to do exercise. So if you can do this, then please do a norm, uh, treadmill uh, stress test. There are caveats to it, we'll discuss about it, um, but this is the best uh, you get in terms of knowing patient's functional capacity and can we reproduce the pain uh, in terms of symptoms of angenum. Uh, this is a simple test. Uh, there would be a treadmill, you would be hooked uh, with these wires or electrodes. Um, then there will be a graded uh, uh, exercise. We slowly increase the uh, speed of the treadmill and the incline of the treadmill. Your ECG is continuously monitored and your blood pressure is checked on a regular basis. There are multiple protocols for uh, exercising. Uh, Bruce protocol is the commonest we use, then there is modified Bruce protocol, Norton protocol, depending upon uh, what the patient's exercise capacity is and what uh, we want from the stress, but Bruce protocol is the commonest used. Patient can go also on a bike. Uh, some centers use bike all the time. Uh, people who, are in, uh, who have knee problems or unable to walk on a treadmill because of uh, balance issues can use a bike. And the uh, other things, again, it's a graded exercise. Rest of the things remain the same. So it's widely available. It's cheap. And it provides a good uh, measure of functional capacity. But uh, there are limitations because if you have a non-diagnostic or abnormal baseline of ECG, you have a left bundle branch block, you have a paced rhythm, you have an LVH, you have ST segment depressions greater than 0.5 millimeters, then the test is not good. Uh, in, these, in these situations, uh, we usually do some sort of imaging because there's a lower sensitivity and specificity. And you cannot localize. So if there are uh, depressions in the inferior leads, doesn't mean that you would have uh, an inferior ischemia. This is non-localized, unless and until you have a ST segment elevation, which is pretty good uh, in localizing. So uh, this is the physiology which happens. We have increased cardiac output. We have increased stroke volume. We have increased sympathetic discharge, increased epinephrine, norepinephrine, and nephrine increase skeletal blood flow, and your uh, peripheral vascular resistance decreases, and your diastolic blood pressure may decrease or remain the same. So what our endpoints are heart rate, blood pressure, exercise capacity, ECG, and symptoms. So if you find any of these uh, reading the endpoints, then uh, we, we uh, uh, say the test is good to interpret. A few things, uh, we have 85% of maximum predicted heart rate, which is 220 minus age. Uh, uh, and that is an optimal uh, test for Bruce protocol, um, but you do not have to stop it. I have seen a lot of tests which come back where they stop the exercise because uh, they achieve the target heart rate. No, it should be to their maximum exercise capacity or any of these uh, uh, symptoms or ECG changes happen, then you stop it uh, when you feel unsafe about it. Otherwise, please don't stop it. And uh, please hold beta blockers uh, 24 to 48 hours before testing. We get a lot of patients who are on beta blockers. We cannot achieve their target heart rate. We cannot get the ischemia burden, and the test does not uh, come out good. So if, you have, uh, if your patient has taken beta blockers, then usually we would say uh, uh, to postpone that test. And patients should eat breakfast, wear uh, comfortable shoes and clothes for this test. Absolute contraindication to exercise stress testing. Uh, if you have a recent myocardial infarction, please don't do it. Unstable angina. So patients are here in the hospital if they are having chest pain uh, or they have a positive troponin, please do not do a uh, uh, exercise stress test. Uh, then you have uncontrolled uh, uh, or hemodynamically compromising arrhythmias, uh, AFib with RVR or any VT, uh, then we do not do it. Uh, any endocarditis, no. Uh, this is very important that uh, severe and symptomatic aortic stenosis, many a times we have patients who have chest pain symptoms because of aortic stenosis and they show up for a stress test. Uh, we should not be doing that. This is very dangerous. 
uh, decompensated heart failure. As we all know, you have to first compensate and then we do it. And usually uh, in heart failure issue uh, times, we have other hemodynamic changes which will not give a good test. Uh, acute pulmonary embolism and DVT, uh, myocarditis and pericarditis, uh, and active aortic dissection. So, and any physical disability that compromises patient safety, mainly the balance issues, uh, where we should not be putting patients on uh, a treadmill. Sometimes, if that is an issue, we have talked about using a bike. Um, you can do these tests in uh, uh, these situations uh, where uh, there's a left main stenosis. I usually don't prefer it. Uh, even in moderate to severe aortic stenosis, uh, this can become dangerous uh, because sometimes our numbers may not be correct. And when there is a uh, high workload, uh, these can become symptomatic and hemodynamically significant. Um, with uncontrolled heart rates, you are not going to get anywhere. Um, and complete heart block uh, uh, or advanced heart block, you will see that you need more cardiac output and then there are problems with it. Um, Hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy with severe resting gradient, you will get into trouble. We use beta blockers for that reason that we do not want to the heart rate to increase. Uh, as uh, the tachycardia uh, happens, uh, the obstruction increases, patient becomes symptomatic, and you can get into trouble. Uh, CVAs. Uh, one thing which you will see more than anything is uh, uncontrolled blood pressure. So if your resting blood pressure is greater than 200 over 110, there is no reason to do this exercise. What happens is we ask our patients to hold medications uh, and uh, there is some or the other error. And uh, once a week or once every two weeks, we have this situation in our office where the blood pressure is too high or heart rates are too high where we have to cancel the test. And if you have anemia or hyperthyroidism, um, please don't do it. Please correct the uh, underlying condition first, and then you do a test because there is no, uh, because these can cause demand ischemia and you'll, you'll have a falsely abnormal test. And also you're putting patient at risk. So if you have 10 METs with the Bruce protocol, it's an absolutely wonderful test. So your mortality is less than 1% in one year. Even in five years, your mortality is very low. So if you see a 10 METs uh, workload, this is very good. Now, if you have less than four METs, the mortality is 5%. No matter what you do, the mortality is 5%. And this has been proven in multiple studies of five years. And the other high risk uh, of the test are ST depressions greater than one millimeter, multi, uh, uh, and duration of symptom limited exercise less than six METs. Uh, and if you are unable to increase your systolic blood pressure, or if there's a sustained decrease in uh, blood pressure, uh, then it's a bad, uh, bad deal. Uh, so ST depression greater than two millimeters at low workload. So this is, this is very important. Uh, and greater than five leads and persisting greater than five minutes in recovery uh, is a bad sign. I have few patients and usually they turn out to be high grade uh, uh, proximal uh, epicardial coronary arteries uh, disease. If you have exercise induced ST elevation, um, you most likely will find a problem and this is good. As soon as you see uh, exercise induced ST elevation, you stop the test. Uh, and if you start having angina at low workload um, or if you have symptomatic VT, uh, these are bad prognostic uh, indicators. So uh, what are the causes of uh, false positive and false negative test? You have to understand these things because aortic valve disease will cause you uh, false positive. Uh, ath uh, athletes have uh, these ST depressions, which we know. Uh, digoxin usually will cause baseline ECG abnormalities, but if uh, the baseline ECG abnormalities are not there, uh, then um, uh, it can, with exercise, cause it. Uh, so I usually, if the patient is on digoxin, I don't order a uh, treadmill-only test. Uh, female sex, we, we have talked about, and we'll talk it further, uh, that uh, only two-thirds of uh, cases are... Uh, uh, good one third are falsely positive. So if your pretest probability is low uh, and if it is a female sex, uh, usually we would not get too much out of uh, uh, a 
positive test, but if the test is negative with the greater than 10 METs, then you know that uh, the outcome is very good and you can stop there. Um, we, we are not uh, doing the test in left ventral branch uh, block anyway, and these we have already talked about that uh, uh, can uh, have uh, uh, contraindication for this. So question is when to do imaging. So even if you can exercise, but if you have left bundle branch block, so this happens all the time in the hospital, uh, when to exercise and when to, know, when to do imaging and not. So we see a lot of patients uh, who have uh, normal ECG, they can exercise, but they end up going for imaging. So if you have uh, if you can exercise and if you do not have these problems, then please do treadmill only test and then we can go from there if there is an uh, issue of falsely positive and all that. Uh, you can, uh, whenever there is space rhythm, you will not get anything out of the ECG. Uh, abnormal ST segment baseline greater than 0 0.5 millimeter, any digoxin, LVH, WPW. Uh, and if you have a patient with prior revascularization, this is always an, uh, uh, I put a question mark here because uh, there is always this issue uh, of that the ECG is normal, why don't you first do the testing? But a lot of studies have shown that uh, uh, an imaging study will give you better uh, outcome uh, in terms of what to do next. And we talked about it that to consider use in women because of a high falsely positive uh, treadmill only tests. So you're, you have uh, uh, four different kind of imaging, echocardiogram, SPECT, PET, and MRI, and you have these different kind of stresses uh, which you uh, can use. So you can get them to exercise even if they have LVH or ab abnormalities on uh, ECG because your goal is to increase the heart rate and then you can image it with one of these. So one, any of these and any of these will work. Uh, and we can use it in different combination depending upon the patient situation and we'll go over that. So when to do SPECT and PET, so what we call the nuclear uh, test. Uh, here in our institution, we do not have PET uh, uh, for ca cardiac PET, but we have SPECT. Um, cardiac PET uh, at Iowa Heart Center, we do uh, at, in, uh, in Des Moines uh, and in West Des Moines. And uh, SPECT can be done uh, even uh, as an outpatient here, inpatient here, et cetera. Uh, so whenever you have a left bundle branch block or paste rhythm, uh, do a, a SPECT or a PET uh, and also use your regular sun stress. Um, uh, exercise usually would be a problematic here. Uh, same thing with tachydisarrhythmias. Now, if you have uh, uh, patients on beta blockers, uh, you're, you're not going to get the heart rate up, so regular sun stress may be uh, important there. There are some issues, and we try to hold beta blockers, but you can have uh, people coming on beta blockers or sotolol if they have atrial fibrillation. Now, the advantages uh, is uh, uh, for PET and uh, SPECT is uh, they can be used in patients with moderate to high pretest probability. So uh, this is an important uh, uh, feature here. Uh, I did not put uh, the uh, reference to these articles because there are a lot of nuances to those articles. Uh, but uh, when you have uh, our 80-year-old lady with uh, um, coronary artery disease and you know that there is a problem um, and you want to see if the LED territory has a problem or not, then these tests can be very useful. They give you perfusion. Uh, which is important in terms of if there is any myocardial infarction or if there is any hibernating myocardium, and they give you the function we can localize disease. Uh, these are good tests to risk stratify, um, and uh, pharmacological stress may be performed uh, with these tests, and it, in fact, they are uh, easy. And uh, they are uh, uh, have a higher sensitivity than echocardiogram, stress echocardiogram. And the reason for these tests are uh, they are based on flow heterogeneity. So when we have a vasodilatation or, uh, or the uh, increase in flow with exercise, uh, we, uh, we, it, we presume that with the um, flow-limiting stenosis, there would be less flow uh, to that part of myocardium. There will be less uptake of the tracer, 
which we uh, see on our spectral pet. And, and that these tests are totally dependent on flow heterogeneity. So uh, what are the limitations? Uh, they are expensive. Uh, and many of our patients uh, have issues of obesity. Uh, then there can be attenuation art artifact related to breast or diaphragm. So their specificity decreases and there is radiation exposure. We have to keep in mind the radiation exposure. And our patients uh, uh, who are mainly females, uh, who are young, and we start exposing them to radiation in 20 years later, uh, we can have radiation-related uh, cancers, et cetera. Uh, the problems is also uh, happen with morbid obesity, uh, which we define as BMI greater than 40. Sometimes there is a central obesity and BMI may not be 40, but still there is a problem. And to get around that, PET is a good source. And nowadays, their new cameras have come called DSPEC cameras. They have different uh, material, uh, the CZT crystals they call, uh, and uh, uh, the crystals are different uh, and they can be better in terms of image quality. Uh, I do not think we have a D-spec camera here, but uh, uh, at Iowa Heart Center in Des Moines, we have D-spec camera for uh, people with the BMI of 40. The other way around for people with uh, higher BMIs, you can order a two-day uh, scan. So both days, resting and uh, uh, stressing, we use higher 30 millicuries uh, or nearly 30 millicuries dosing for that. So, we, we, we have to consider the radiation and we have to understand the concept of radiation. So if you are doing an echocardiogram or an EKG, there is no radiation. So these become our preferred, uh, preferred testing uh, because a lot of patients would be getting repeated testing and we have to keep in consideration the total radiation dose. And for comparison, uh, just think about a chest X-ray ha has 0.1 millisievert. Uh, and if you do a coronary angiogram, uh, it's around 7 millisieverts. So you can see how many x-rays this patient is getting. And if you are doing a PCI, it's around 15 millisieverts. Now, cardiac CT angiography, when we started, it was 10 to 16 millisieverts. But now we have newer protocols, newer machines, low radiation. And now they call, uh, they can do it at 1 to 1.5 millisieverts. Uh, not everybody has those machines. Uh, I've not talked to our uh, uh, Director Scott, I'll have to figure it out how much radiation we are using here in our institute. Uh, nuclear uh, stress test SPECT uh, or uh, PET, they usually PET is 82 uh, rubidium uh, and SPECT we use usually technetium, either it's a system AB or tetrafosmin. Uh, they are 10, 10 millisieverts uh, to 12 millisieverts. Again, uh, you have to consider if a patient is obese and if you are doing a two-day test, it is higher. Uh, thallium we hardly use now. So we have uh, uh, gone over it, but I wanted to make sure that we understand that uh, that uh, uh, we do these scans when patient is in atrial fibrillation, left bundle branch block, they have a paced rhythm or LVH. So if they have an abnormal baseline, we need, uh, and they are unable to exercise. Now, patients with prior revascularization, we have talked about it a little bit. Uh, this is a good test for them. And uh, patients with higher likelihood of disease because then um, we, we uh, have issue with the false negatives uh, is less here. And if patient cannot get a good echocardiogram, then this is a good test. Now... Whenever you read a stress test, we have ordered a stress test, and when you read it, uh, what are the high-risk uh, features when you have to call uh, your cardiology colleagues? That when you see multiple reversible defects, uh, that means there can be a multivessel disease. When there's a large perfusion defect, and large defined is greater than 10% usually, um, and uh, uh, some people will say 25%, a uh, very large kind of thing. Uh, and if you see an increased lung radio tracer uptake, then this is a high-risk test, and this may be related to heart failure or something else. And if you, what we call a TID, transient ischemic dilatation or transient dilatation of left ventricle, which is a ratio between the stress and uh, rest, 
And if it is greater than, depending upon the software, uh, 1.24 to 1.3, uh, it's a high risk test. Uh, usually this is associated with uh, three vessel disease. One third of the time when you see transient dilatation of LV, you will see um, major uh, uh, epicardial stenosis. If you have a depressed resting left ventricular ejection fraction, these patients are anyway high risk. Uh, and if you have an increased right ventricular radio tracer uptake, uh, then um, if their report mentions that, then uh, there can be other issues, including RV failure, et cetera, going on. To, this is my favorite test is exercise stress echocardiogram. And uh, this is cheap. This is readily available. It, uh, direct visualization of wall motion, LV function, anatomy. Um, localized regional abnormality, uh, and this has higher specificity. And these are nearly the same numbers depending upon which, uh, uh, which uh, study you go to, but slightly higher uh, uh, specificity and a higher sensitivity than the treadmill alone because treadmill is, as we talked about, two-thirds time right, one-third time wrong. And the biggest thing is does not get radiation. So exercise stress echocardiogram uh, is a very good uh, tool for ischemia evaluation. The limitations are, uh, it's technically very difficult. Uh, and uh, you need very good echotechs uh, who have been doing this thing. And our patients are getting bigger. They may have COPD. They may have poor acoustic windows. Um, and uh, as we talked about, it's less sensitive uh, uh, than myocardial perfusion imaging study. If you look into uh, the ischemia cascade, if you remember that, uh, the perfusion defects happen earlier and the systolic dysfunction uh, were later. So uh, the, that is uh, the reason for it's uh, uh, less sensitive. Uh, and uh, somehow myocardial perfusion imaging study has a lot of studies, a lot of studies, 5,000 people studies, 10,000 people meta-analysis, and uh, stress echocardiogram has less, but it's a very, very good test. Uh, and interpretable image quality uh, uh, may be obtained during submaximal heart rate, and those becomes an issue when, when, when are we getting the images and all those things. Usually, post-exercise, we have to get images in one minute uh, where we can get the best uh, test results. Otherwise, uh, our uh, uh, test uh, quality decreases. So uh, what do these exercise uh, stress echoes from prognostication mean? So if you have a normal test, uh, you have less than 1% chance of uh, dying per year uh, from cardiac causes. Uh, and uh, also, this is called MACE, uh, cardiac death, non-fatal MI, and cardiac revascularization is less than 1%. Uh, and event-free survival, even after three years, is greater than 97%. So a normal uh, stress test, an uh, exercise stress test, is a very good prognostic. And false negative stress echo is more common uh, in a single vessel disease or diseases with left circumflex. So sometimes, uh, if your suspicion is high, um, you can still have a false negative uh, uh, test uh, with single vessel disease. Um, and if your patient is continuously uh, have anginal symptoms, uh, then we may have to do uh, uh, some other model modality which will come to. Now, this is... The vitamin stress echocardiogram is not favorable uh, for, uh, for many reasons, uh, but it, is, it has its own utility. Uh, and if the patient who has severe COPD, reactive airway disease, actively wheezing, or had caffeine consumption, or has an AV block, and if you want to do ischemia evaluation, this is the test to go to. Uh, Sometimes when you have poor acoustic windows and you cannot do a myocardial perfusion imaging study, then uh, exercise stress echo is not going to give you much in, uh, Im good images, but uh, dobutamine stress echocardiogram with echo contrast uh, can be very helpful uh, to tease out uh, those complexities. So we use dobutamine stress echocardiogram usually for restratifying before vascular surgery. Uh, because these patients have claudications, they cannot walk, and then we want uh, uh, to make sure that we can get a good study uh, in that regard. Uh, because uh, of uh, assessment of regional wall motion at, uh, uh, at the time of the test, 
Uh, this is preferred over vasodilator test. Also with dubutamine, uh, we have a low-dose uh, protocol where we can uh, do uh, the uh, viability assessment. So uh, uh, this, there are different protocols for that. And if you have, want to know if the segment is viable, uh, then we can have a dubutamine stress echocardiogram. This is helpful uh, for revascularization strategies. Um, and there are, that's a, a topic of another talk. Uh, dobutamine can cause uh, ventricular arrhythmias, and uh, we have to be careful. So they need continuous monitoring, and sometimes an MI can be uh, can happen, and it's uh, uncommon, but we have to be very careful about it. And this is where you have to have a good history, make sure their troponins are negative, uh, and you do not have any baseline arrhythmias. Uh, the other problem is if your heart rate doesn't go up. Uh, uh, then we have to give you uh, uh, give the patient atropine, and that can cause uh, uh, palpitations, uh, headaches, nausea, anxiety, tremors, etc. Et so uh, uh, this is uh, the thing which many patients don't like. It uh, we have to use atropine multiple times uh, in many cases uh, to get the heart rate up, and atropine is given in very small incremental doses. So. What to, so you have uh, uh, one arm which is physiological and then uh, we are talking about anatomical uh, and this is CT angiography. CT angiography is available here. Uh, you can get the coronary morphology, you can look at the plaques, uh, you can look at the stenosis severity, and you can also look at the other organs. And nowadays a new kid in the block is called FFR, fractional flow reserve CT where they can also see if these stenosis, if there is a stenosis which is hemodynamically uh, significant or not. And these are some nice images from uh, where I took it, and this, uh, these arteries can be uh, viewed very uh, clearly. Uh, but that may not be always the case, uh, but this is a good test, and we'll, uh, we have some time, we'll talk about it. So it's very sensitive, and it's a very high negative predictive value. Um, and... Uh, uh, that is where uh, the strength is. Uh, it uh, uses iodinated contrast. Uh, uh, if there is uh, arrhythmias, it, uh, the test quality is not good, better in sinus rhythm and sinus bradycardia. It can be done in AFib if you slow them out. Uh, if you have a very high calcium uh, score, um, they have cutoffs of 700, 800, then uh, they will not do a CT angio. The motion is the biggest problem here. Uh, and uh, uh, with uh, morbidly obese patients, we don't get good quality. I wanted to bring uh, to your attention that there was a big uh, study done called PROMISE study. Uh, it was outcomes of anatomical versus functional testing of coronary artery disease. And they did functional uh, testing with nuclear SPECT uh, uh, stress echoes. And then they did uh, this uh, uh, anatomy with the uh, uh, coronary CTA. And they looked at these patients for more than three years. And you can see uh, that the outcomes, whether you do a functional study uh, or uh, or uh, an anatomical study like CT are equal. And this is a paradigm shift uh, in how we would be doing uh, the testing as such. And there will be more, uh, more uh, coronary CTs uh, would be being done. The other thing is you see that there is a very low event rate. So usually these are stable patients and uh, this has to be considered that uh, in our future planning that these patients are, have very low event rate, so we do not have to be um, uh, very uh, adamant that we need to do testing right away uh, or make a treatment plan uh, according to the testing right away. Uh, CT angiography can also give us coronary anomalies, uh, cardiac masses, pericardium, pulmonary vein assessments, and bypass evaluation. So we use these uh, uh, other things also. Uh, stress MRI is not available. It's the principles are still the same. They have uh, late catalytic enhancement, uh, and then they can see the uh, the uh, area under risk. Uh, and since we don't have it, uh, um, I I'm not very much familiar with it. Um, they have done, this is pretty much same as uh, uh, other studies, uh, including myocardial perfusion imaging studies or stress echocardiograms. If you have a, a late gradolian enhancement, it's a worse prognosis. These tests, uh, how do they perform? You can see 
uh, 60 to 90 percent, 60s are the ECG, 90s are the imaging studies, uh, and stress echocardiography is somewhere between 80 to 85. Uh, we have thousands of patients. These are very well-validated tests. Uh, and if you can see, the CTs have 90% sensitivity, but the specificity is very low. The newer techniques have, would, be, would be better. Uh, you would be reading a lot about uh, ischemia trial because this is a very a new thing which has come up. Uh, in this trial, all patients had uh, uh, CCTA in, uh, at one point, and then they decided invasive therapies versus optimal medical therapy. And uh, uh, even if you stented or not stented and treated with medications, uh, the outcomes were equal. Uh, there are a lot of nuances uh, to it. Uh, there is no clear-cut uh, 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 discussion about it right now, so more to come. Uh, but uh, what uh, we are uh, thinking is that this will establish coronary CTA uh, in, uh, as a first line uh, of test uh, because of uh, 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 this ischemia trial and PROMISE trial. Uh, and ease of doing it and availability of doing it. So whenever you have something, you can use it. COVID-19 situation, if it is the ACS decision to go for cardiac catheterization to be done by the cardiologist, uh, stable patients, low event rate, these are uh, uh, stable patients, it's prudent to wait, let uh, COVID-19 situation improve, and then, uh, then you can do the testing. And uh, if the patients are not COVID-19, and even um, in the current situation, as we our all hospitals are full in central Iowa, uh, and early discharge and outpatient testing uh, may be a preferred choice because of uh, a very low event rate. Um, and these are the things which we have already discussed. And low-risk patients can be discharged with a follow-up to see a cardiologist or PCP in 72 hours or a plan for ischemia evaluation. You do not need to keep the patient over, uh, over the weekend if they are low-risk, ruled out, no EC changes, no chest pain. And all, patient, all patients should be discharged on uh, guideline-directed medical therapy or optimal medical therapy. Um, one uh, thing which we wanted to cover today was this wearable uh, monitoring devices, everybody is wearing an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or this patch and all those things. And uh, as I started looking into it, there is a multiple, multiple things in the market and they are doing all these things, uh, testing all these things, keep a track of all these things. They can be watches, phones, patches, headbands, Google Glass, necklaces and all that. And uh, I picked up a few of them uh, just to talk uh, in the next three to four minutes. And the Cardia Mobile uh, is an uh, ECG monitoring and AFib detection. You can see patients put their two fingers and uh, you get an ECG recording uh, on your smartphone. It's $100 uh, and uh, I like it. It, uh, it has given a lot of patients uh, uh, mental satisfaction. If they go into atrial fibrillation or if they think they are in the atrial fibrillation, they will just go check them out and uh, we will know what the uh, rhythm is. Uh, and they can transmit it uh, to their cardiologist. Um, uh, Dr. Sorrentino, our uh, electrophysiologist, uh, liked this very much. Uh, and it has given us some capabilities of not getting the patient in the office in this COVID-19 situation and do some uh, telehealth uh, consults in this regard. Um, Apple Watch, uh, my wife wants to watch, uh, buy it because it has so many different things. But uh, for a cardiologist, uh, uh, we can say that it does a good ECG monitoring and they have uh, uh, AF detection, uh, atrial fibrillation detection. And they had a good study. Uh, there were some uh, drawbacks to it, uh, but I'm pretty sure uh, they would be uh, working uh, 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 to uh, clear those kinks. And uh, whosoever patient had brought to me, I'm pretty impressed by it. So um, it's expensive. Uh, it's Apple. I have one stock in Apple, so it becomes a financial issue now. Uh, this was a Scanadu uh, device which was bought by Inui Health and the uh, Healthy IO. This was uh, the, uh, the device which was going uh, through this thing. Then there was some, uh, they called it a Scanadu and all those things. Uh, it's not in uh, favor right now, but I think uh, the Israelis have bought it and uh, they will uh, make something out of it. But these were the devices which were three, four years ago uh, popular. 
This you will see it all, uh, here, uh, zero patch. Uh, this is an ECG monitoring and arrhythmia detection, uh, and it's paid by the insurance companies also. Uh, you put this patch there, uh, and then uh, you have uh, send it back, and they monitor it, and then, then they give you. This is kind of an event monitor for 14 days. It's easy to put. Uh, uh, our uh, techs can put it. Uh, this is a new want uh, medical cardiac telemetry device, and again, the system is the same. Uh, you have a patch, and then you have a, a mobile transmitter, and this is a continuous mobile monitoring uh, at a central pace. And uh, this is a monitoring center, and if there is a problem, then uh, they send uh, these uh, uh, ECG tracings to us. Um, then there are a whole lot of fitness uh, trackers, Fitbit, uh, Samsung uh, is also doing a lot of work. Uh, Google has a branch called Verily, which is uh, doing uh, uh, a lot of work in that regard. And I get some questions from uh, people I know who work there. Um, and so uh, this, is, this will be uh, uh, quite a bit of change in the way we practice uh, cardiology and medicine how these uh, devices will give us the input. Uh, it may cause a lot of anxiety. It may cause a lot of uh, false calls to start with, but uh, later it will improve. Now, another thing which I did not put was uh, the home blood pressure monitoring. Uh, that is very important, and uh, we, we uh, are uh, telling our patients to do home blood pressure monitoring quite a bit. Uh, and the devices are $50 or so, and they are pretty reasonable. Uh, any questions? If you have questions, please type it into the questions box. Uh, what is the full question? So far, uh, if patients uh, have symptoms or they have a known cardiac disease, uh, we like to have an ECG annually. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of data about uh, ECG being not useful in asymptomatic patients who do not have any uh, cardiac disease. So you, uh, ECG would be helpful only if you have symptoms, uh, not for annual physicals, uh, unless until you have a cardiac disease. The other question about ECG uh, is, is it helpful to have ECG for pre-op uh, pre evaluation? And uh, that's also a big question. We still have in our algorithms to have ECG for pre-op evaluation, uh, but if, patient does not have any symptoms or no known cardiac disease, uh, then e use of ECG is still controversial. Um, baseline ECG, I do not know. Um, we uh, do it, so if there is no symptom, there is no role of baseline ECG. It's, uh, and Medicare will do uh, uh, a baseline ECG at uh, 65. Um, I do not know the exact answer should we do a baseline ECG on everybody. So thank you very much. Uh, there is no other question. Um, uh, we are available uh, here. Cardiology service is available. Uh, we share call uh, with uh, Medically Cardiology. Uh, uh, three of us, uh, Dr. Bart, Dr. Sorrentino, and myself are on call for Iowa Heart Center. And Dr. Kumar is our interventional cardiologist who is, works here daytime. So if you have any questions, concerns, please do not hesitate to let us know. Dr. Rasmussen and Dr. Christensen are also available for any questions. Thank you.